feel the power. Welcome to a Righteous Invasion of Truth with Dr. Abel Damina. Welcome to the ever-increasing world feast. I'm excited to welcome you, friends and family, right here on Facebook, YouTube, and all our social media handles. Abel Damina is my name. Listen, the truth of the word of God is, when God's word is preached and taught, God's power to save is made available. Brother Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. I'm honored to serve you grace today, to bring you clarity of teaching from the word of God. Invite a friend, a loved one, create watch parties, tag people, because the word is going to come very hot and powerful today. You know, there's a mandate of God on my life to reintroduce Jesus to this generation, equipping the believer to know who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. It is with that mandate in mind that this message is coming to you right now. It will change your life forever. However, remember the scripture tells us the time shall come when they shall not endure sound doctrine. The Greek word hugaino wholesome doctrine. There's an endurance required. So as you listen, please painstakingly and patiently listen to the teaching of God's word. Don't listen with a critical mind. Listen with a mind to learn. You know, Jesus said, learn of me for I am meek and lowly of heart and you shall find rest. So there's a meekness required. Brother James says, with meekness, receive the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. There's a meekness required. And there's endurance required where sound doctrine is concerned. So you want to patiently follow the teachings. Most of my teachings are in a series. So get ready to follow. And if there's anything you don't understand, be patient. The teachings will continue to explain themselves until you come to a place of understanding and clarity in the knowledge of Christ. One more thing to say with you today. If you're in an area where there's no Bible teaching church, where the message of Christ like this is preached, you can start one or you can join any of our campuses. Our campuses are extension houses of our local church where brethren come together and they are fed, they are taught, they take responsibility, they pray together, they reach out to the people in their community with the truth of God's word. Our campuses are lighthouses in nations and cities and communities where believers come together and they are taught the word of God by myself. And I'm excited if you want to be a part of what we're doing around your community or you want to start one. All you need to do is shoot me a mail today, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. And we shall guide you on what to do to either begin one campus or join another. It's not good for you to be in isolation. The Bible says, do not dismiss the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. In prophecy, the word of God tells us that God will bring the solitary into families. You are a member of a family and there is no family that does not have a gathering. Our gathering is our assemblage to be taught, to be equipped, and to become responsible for other people's growth. It's so important, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you today. Lastly, there's a plethora of books I have written that addresses so many issues of the Christian faith. They're all on the screen. Look at this. Today, you can order for a book or two or all the set by shooting an email to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. Including today's message, you can order for the CD or the DVD. The entire essence is to nourish you, enrich you, and equip you with robust understanding of your relationship with Almighty God. I'm excited to be able to serve you. Fasting your seatbelts. Let me take you right now into a gospel adventure, into the service where the spirit of our God is already moving. Happy viewing. We're beginning a teaching on the revelation of Jesus, and we're going to stay in the book of Revelation. We're going to begin with Revelation chapter 1, verse number 1. I'll read the King James and I'll read the Amplified Version. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Please pay attention and you need your pen and paper because we're going to do quite some work here. Give me the Amplified of the same verse. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, his unveiling of the divine mysteries. God gave it to him to disclose and make known to his bond servants certain things which must shortly and speedily come to pass in their entirety. 
And he sent and communicated it through his angel messenger to his bond servant, John. So the revelation of Jesus, the revelation of Jesus, if your Bible was mine, I will underline that word, the revelation of Jesus, because that's key. Jesus came to reveal the Father to us. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness that God is manifest in the flesh. God is manifest in the flesh. So Jesus came to reveal the Father to us. The Holy Ghost is here to reveal Jesus to us. The Holy Ghost is here today to reveal Jesus to us. John chapter 16, verse 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. Next verse. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. He shall take of mine and he will show it to you. He will not speak of himself. The Holy Ghost will not speak of himself. He shall take of mine and he will show it to you. He shall glorify me. This is Jesus speaking. So Jesus came to reveal the Father to us. He that has seen me has seen the Father. John chapter 14. He that has seen me has seen the Father. But the Holy Spirit is here today to reveal Jesus to us. Why? Because the revelation of Jesus unveils the believer. The revelation of Jesus unveils the believer. And there can be no better place to talk about the revelation of Jesus other than in the book of Revelation, which is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, the revelation of Jesus is so important because the revelation of Jesus is the cure to identity crisis in the body of Christ. You will never know who you are till you know who he is. And you will never know who he is until he is revealed to you. The revelation of Jesus unveils the believer's identity in Christ. And you will never know what you have till you know who you are. And you will never know what you can do till you know what you have. So the revelation of Jesus is so critical because it unveils the resources of the believer to him that has been made available to him by the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And so it's important to study the revelation of Jesus. The revelation of Jesus. It unveils our resources to us. Our identity, our capacity, and our ability and resources. Revelation means Christ is unveiled. Christ is unveiled. Alright? Now, the reason why many people have problems with the book of Revelation is because of due diligence in study. Alright? Lack of due diligence. Um, uh, because... It must be clear in our minds that, first of all, the Bible does not have contradictions. The Bible, please, that's very important. The Bible does not have contradictions. So if you seem to see anything that looks like a contradiction, it only exists in your mind. Because your mind has not been renewed to see the scriptures in the light of Christ. Now you must realize that the Bible was not written with chapters and verses. It was not written with chapters and verses, meaning the chapters and verses were introduced by the translators to ease, to make it easy for you to read. That will mean, therefore, that you must follow the context of each book. Don't just stay with a verse or a chapter. You must look at the entire context of each book. Since they were not written with chapters and verses, it means there were a flow of thoughts and you must be able to follow the thought to its logical conclusion to have a clarity of what is being communicated. Please, that's very important in Bible study. Not just for the book of Revelation, but in the entire study of the scriptures. Now, it is important, therefore, to read the whole letter, you know, study the whole, read the whole letter from the beginning to the end, which we're going to be doing with this book, and understand the intent of the author when he wrote his letter. This is because a text of scripture 
can never mean today what it never meant when it was first written. A text of scripture can never mean today what it never meant when it was first written. When it was first written, its intent then is still its intent now, and it will still be its intent forever. And that's why it's important to stay with the context of the scriptures. So clearly, the book of Revelation was written by an apostle called John. John, one of the apostles of Jesus, one of the twelve. Because that Revelation 1, 1 says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Now remember, these things which must shortly come to pass is not today. Things which must shortly come to pass then. When the revelation was given to John, things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John, the apostle. And we have evidence in the Bible that this apostle wrote four other books. He wrote four other books. John, the synoptic account, and then 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, all right, which is the epistles. So this apostle who wrote Revelation wrote the book of John in the Synoptic Gospels and he wrote 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. Very important. It will come in handy in the next few minutes. Now, in Revelation chapter 1 verse 4, you will see clearly, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now observe verse 1 and 2. He referred to his writing as the revelation or the testimony of Jesus Christ. The revelation or the testimony of Jesus Christ. That means like every epistle, even the synoptic accounts of the Old Testament books of the Bible, the focus and the central theme of the book of Revelation is Jesus. The focus and the central theme of this book is the person of Jesus. All right? And this was not in reference to the incarnation, but this was in reference to the resurrection. This was not in reference to the incarnation. This was in reference to the resurrection, the book of Revelation. To the resurrection because he now says the first begotten from the dead and his church. To the first begotten from the dead and his church. Look at Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. Read for me. And from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Unto him that loved us. The faithful witness and the first begotten from the dead. So this later was written as a revelation of Jesus, the risen Lord, not the incarnate Christ. So I want you to have that at the back of your mind. It was a later concerning Jesus, the risen Lord, the one who loved us, washed us from our sins in his own blood. Please take note of the tenses. The one who loved us, washed us from our sins in his own blood. If your Bible was mine, that's a verse to underline or circle. From Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved, tenses us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And unquestionably, this is the focus of all the epistles. All the epistles are focused on the finished work of Christ. Who loved us, washed us in his blood. Please, this is key. This verse we just read, verse 5, is very key to this book. Now, if you observe in the epistles, the epistle says the same thing. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Read for me. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. If one died for all, then we're all dead. Verse 15. 
and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. And because he died for all, those who live should no longer live for themselves. We no longer live for us. We no longer live for us. We are no longer self-centered. That they should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Read verse 16 and 17. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So, so the same thing, brother John, is communicating in Revelation is what the apostles communicated in the epistles. Epistles like what we just read. Another epistle where you will see the same message communicated in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 20. Which he wrote in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And I put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So Corinthians tells us he died for us. Ephesians tells us he died for us. He gave us all things. He has become all things to us. Ephesians 2 4 but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins had quickened us together with Christ by grace you are saved verse 6 and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, verse 9. Not of works, lest any man should boast, verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Verse 11, wherefore remember that he being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called on circumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off and midnight, by the blood of Christ. The same thing John the beloved is saying in Revelation. He washed us. He loved us with his own blood. All right? The same thing the epistles kept talking about. In Ephesians 3, 14, For this cause I bow my knees under the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Philemon 1, 5, Hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. That the communication of your faith may become effectual, how? By the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you, in Christ Jesus. Hebrews 2.10 For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Verse 11 For both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 to 24. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So you see that all through the epistles, he kept establishing the fact that what Christ has done for us is perfect. What Christ has done for us is total. What Christ has done for us is complete. He takes time to establish that through the epistles, as we see reflected in Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. I'm still establishing that. First Peter chapter 2 verse 4 to 6. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So everybody here is a spiritual house. We are a spiritual house. We are not a physical entity. We are a spiritual house, a product of the finished work of Christ. 
destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. A spiritual house. Kabayada. Products of his finished work. Washed us. Loved us with his own blood. Are we together in the house? Please, if you are following, can I hear a living amen? amen. Very important. All right? Now read for me the next verse. The next verse. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Verse 7, unto you, therefore which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, verse 8. And a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Verse 9, but you are a chosen generation. I thought somebody would shout hallelujah. <laughs> A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. Kabayada. And sometimes you are not a people at all, but now, not just that you are a people, you are the people of God. That's a place to dance and scream. You are not a people, but now you are the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. 24. Who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree. That we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness. By whose stripes you were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray. But are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. So again we just took time in the last few minutes to establish that the same thing Revelation 1.5 says runs through the epistles. We are washed. We are a people. We are accepted. We are a spiritual house. We are royal priesthood, chosen generation, peculiar people, called out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are the family of God, the family in heaven and on earth. We are God's purchased possession. We are God's priceless treasure. We are the hallmark of God's investment. We are Kabato Belea. We are partakers of the first begotten from the dead. He has wrought his power in us. Everything he acquired in his death, burial, and resurrection, he has put it in us. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, as a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, behold, Kabayana. I said, behold. You will soon discover that for us to study Revelation, we're going to read the entire epistles. Because the only way we can explain Revelation is by unlocking Jesus everywhere in the epistles as it relates to what Revelation John saw. Are we in the house? Please, that's very important. The reason why many people get confused when they read the book of Revelation is because they are trying to interpret the book by the book. You can't interpret the book by the book because the book is full of metaphors and literals. Why? It was a revelation, a vision. So because it was a vision and a revelation, it has metaphors and it has a lot of figurative and symbolic expressions that can only be deciphered or interpreted by looking at the body of truth or the revelation of the scriptures, which is the doctrinal material that unlocks all the codes contained in such revelations. Otherwise, you will be reading and seeing Osama bin Laden as Antichrist. You'll be reading and seeing Barack Obama as Antichrist. You'll be reading and seeing Putin as Antichrist. Because you do err because you know not the scripture nor the power of God. So knowledge is critical. Please, I need your attention. Anything you have had before, just gather them, keep them somewhere in a dustbin somewhere. Don't throw them, but just keep them. Come with me on a clean mind. Let me imprint on your mind pure doctrine concerning the revelation of Jesus Christ. Remember, that's my assignment to the body of Christ. So when I preach and teach the revelation of Jesus, everything in my body comes alive. Everything comes alive. Thank you, Lord. 
Are you in the house? All right. Now, so therefore, the Old Testament books focus on the sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. The Old Testament books focused on the sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow, which was given as a promise unto the fathers by the prophets at sundry times and in diverse manners, which was given unto the fathers by the prophets of the Old Testament as a promise at sundry times and in diverse manners. Luke 24, 25 to 27 tells us that. Luke 24, 44 to 46 tells us that. Romans 1, 1 to 4 tells us that. And 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 15 tells us that. You can take that to study at home and follow what I just said. Number two, the synoptic gospels focus on the incarnation. The synoptic gospels focused on the incarnation. His ministry and his death. The synoptic gospels focus on the incarnation, his ministry, and his death. Number three, the epistles focused on the resurrection. Christ, the firstborn, and his church, the new birth. Christ, the firstborn, and his church, the new birth, or the new creation, or sons of God, or believers. The epistles focus on the resurrection. Christ, the firstborn, and his church, the new birth, new creation, sons of God, or believers. The epistles, very important, focuses on the resurrection. Christ, the firstborn, and his church, the new birth, new creation, sons of God, and believers. Now, back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth. So everybody here that is reading with me, you're already blessed. And they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. The phrase, words of this prophecy, that phrase, if your Bible was mine, I will underline that. Words of this prophecy refers to utterances, utterances. And that is why John in the entire letter kept saying, let him hear what the spirit is saying or what the spirit saith. It's very, very, you know, obvious. It's well pronounced in Revelation. For example, Revelation 2, 7. He that had an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. We shall do exegesis on that shortly. Revelation 2, 11. He that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Revelation 2, 17. He that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Revelation 2, 29. Read for me. 2, 29. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Revelation 3, 6. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the church. Revelation 3.13. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the church. Revelation 3.22. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the church. Now, if you observe, this is totally different. Totally different from how the epistles were written. Totally different. All right? Because this keeps telling you that there is something the Spirit is saying. But the epistles are taken from the scriptures. The, script, the epistles are not what the spirit is saying. The epistles are recorded from what has already been written in the scriptures. But revelation is written based on what the spirit is saying. Jesus and all his apostles, all of them. Jesus and all the apostles. Taught from the Old Testament. None of them stood and said the spirit is saying. All of them taught from the Old Testament. Beginning at Moses. And all the prophets. 
he expounded unto them in all the scriptures. He didn't say what the Spirit is saying. The only person now we are seeing who is saying as utterance what the Spirit is saying without reference from the scriptures is John in a revelation or a vision. Brother Paul quoted from the Old Testament. Brother Peter quoted from the Old Testament. James, all of them quoted from the Old Testament. The only book where you will see what the Spirit is saying or saith is the book of Revelation. In fact, to establish that for them, if you read Luke 24, 25, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and ended in his glory, beginning from Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures. Romans chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the holy scriptures. In the holy scriptures. Ephesians 3, 2. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, what? How that, by revelation, he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, and it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Are you following Second Timothy 3.15 And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. First Peter 1.10 Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Such in what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that shall follow. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. A more sure word of prophecy. This is not what the spirit is saying. A more sure word of prophecy will be reference to the scriptures of the prophets. What has already been written. Are you following? What has already been written. Now, if you're paying attention carefully, what I'm taking time to establish here is that the book of Revelation is written different from the way the rest of the scriptures is written. Meaning, we will need to be very careful in our interpreting of that book. All right? We have a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation private origin or private source for the prophecy that if your bible was mine i will underline the prophecy the prophecy for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man but holy men of god spake as they were moved by the holy ghost the phrase a more sure word of prophecy used by peter in this epistle is different from the phrase words of this prophecy. The prophecy is different from words of this prophecy. Revelation says words of this prophecy. The epistle says the prophecy. All right, please, very important, take note of that. Peter explained it in context as prophecy of the scripture. The prophecy that came in old time by holy men who spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. In other words, he was referring to the utterances of the prophets. Question, what was the summary of the utterances of the prophets? Sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. All right, that's the summary of the, of the utterance or, yeah, of the prophets of the Old Testament which he explained earlier in his first letter 
In First Peter chapter 1, verse 10 to 11. You can write that down for the purpose of reference. So John in the book of Revelation refers strictly to his own writings. Take note, what he saw, number one, what John saw, what John heard, and what John said. What he saw, what he heard, and what he said, which he put together in the book. What he saw, what he heard, and what he said. Then he put it together in a separate book called Revelation. Now, a similar statement will be seen used by Brother Paul in his letter to Timothy. He, he made such a statement when he was writing to Timothy. In 1 Timothy 4.1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The spirit speaketh. That means what brother Paul was saying here to Timothy is not in reference to the scriptures. Was an utterance. Was an utterance. What he heard from the spirit. Just like John saw, heard, and say, different from the scriptures of the prophets of the Old Testament. So, this were utterances via the gifts in the spirit. Now, observe, Brother Paul spoke about some people departing from the faith. What is the faith? The gospel of Christ. The faith is the gospel of Christ. And the fruit of which is to give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. They will avoid the gospel of Christ because they want to be seduced. You know what I mean? When people want to be seduced, they live a good church like this where the word of God is paramount and they look for where woozy woozy goes on because they want to be seduced. If you don't want to be seduced, you stay where the word is taught in simplicity. But if you're looking for woozy woozy, Somebody that, 14 people are chasing you. 14 of them. You must raise 14 altars for each altar to fight each of them. Woozy, woozy. Because you don't like world. So you want extracurricular activities that is coming from extra sp spirit rain. Okay? So now you raise 14 altars to fight 14 people. And you must renew the altar every year. And the sacrifice on the altar will determine how fast the victory will come. Because you want woozy woozy. You don't want to stay with the faith. What is the faith? The gospel of Christ. So what are you doing? You are giving heed to seducing spirits to seduce you. Where do they have their origin from? Doctrine of devils. What is doctrine of devils? Raise 14 altars. There's no such verse that says you should raise 14 altars. It's not in the Bible. Anybody asks you to raise an altar, it's a thief. It's a thief. There is no altar to be raised. Altar is a place of animal sacrifice. Jesus died on our behalf and put an end to animal sacrifice. No more altars. No more altars. You are the temple. What are you looking for altar for? Are you offering animals? Then they will tell you, you know, especially now that politics, you know, in Nigeria, we're about to confront political error. Every politician must have an altar. If you don't have an altar, you'll be defeated. And some politicians are putting the lives of, they are killing small, small children. The blood of little, little babies on top of that altar. And you, you are using well, how much? How much do you want to give? You think that money can fight the blood of a baby on an altar that is confronting you? The woozy, woozy stuff. They just want to mess up with your thinking cap. They want to make a dummy out of you. They are actually collecting your intelligence. All the years your father invested in sending you to school. They want to rubbish all that and bring your mind to where your mind is not familiar with 
Before a man takes advantage of you, he must bring your mind to an unfamiliar territory and make a stupid person out of you. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. There's nothing like altar. Jesus said, all power is given to me. Kabayada, behold, I give you power. So if anybody has offered the blood of animals on an altar somewhere and a shrine and he's using it to target you, just that you stood up in the morning and said, glory, that entire altar with the sacrifice is rendered ineffective. You don't need too much. And if they call your name there, if they call your name, it's not just fire. If they call your name, they will not know what threw them away. They came to pick Jesus. He didn't talk. He just did. Everybody fell on the ground. He walked in. That's a man who knows what he carries. But you see, when you live the gospel, when you live the message of Christ, seducing spirits will seduce you. That's why you got to stay with the world. It may not be exciting, but you don't need excitement. You need to grow. In the knowledge of Christ. Say I hear you. I'm not hearing you. Say I hear you. So they shall depart from the message of Christ. And they shall give heed to seducing spirits. And brother Paul gave a warning here. And he called it the doctrine of devils. So brother Paul was warning Timothy. Of the conduct of some believers. That was what was happening at that time. In Paul's time. And because of that conduct of believers not paying attention to the word of God, Brother Paul wrote to Timothy. And that is why people like Brother John wrote the letter to the seven churches. Because apostasy was setting in. And people's conduct was becoming compromised. People's behavior was becoming compromised. People were no more loyal to the message of Christ. People were looking for extra curricular things to engage themselves in. Christianity for them was too boring. They needed some activities to spice up. And the moment you start looking for how to make Christianity exciting, if the fact that Jesus died, was buried on the third day he rose, does not excite you, if you are looking for any other thing to add to what he has done, you become a victim of deception. So the church had started entering a period of apostasy. That is why John wrote the letter to the seven churches. You will soon see something. That's why that letter was written. Reminding them that there is a superior revelation. Jesus is everything. He wrote that letter to bring them to a place of revelation. So they can see Christ. Because once you see Christ, that's the end of discussion. Ah, ah. If you go down in that chapter 1, you will see that John said, I was in the spirit on the last day. Now, so for you to be in the spirit means he was right, right before the Lord. He says, and then I heard a voice from behind. And if you're in the spirit before the Lord, you should hear the voice in front. But he heard the voice from behind. And there were seven, seven churches with seven candlesticks. And the voice was walking in the midst of the seven churches and talking. That means the seven churches, we are not where the revelation is. They were outside. When they should be inside, they were outside. And that's happening to our churches today. The message of Christ is outside. When it should be in the church, eh, eh, entertainment has taken over the altars. Okay? Skill acquisition has taken over the altars. How to make it in recession has taken over the altars. The revelation is outside. When it should be inside. So you hear God saying, in that book of Revelation, as we read on, in one of, to one of those churches, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. How can Jesus 
be outside a church, standing at the door of his church, and he's knocking. He's not talking to a sinner. He's talking to a church. In Re Revelation 3, behold, I stand at the door. A man that is knocking means he's outside. Many churches have pushed him out. Some people can be in a church three years. They don't know Jesus except the name for prayer. He's outside. So it was because of that state of apostasy that in the island of Patmos, John caught that revelation and now wrote the book of Revelation as letters to seven churches. So what we're going to be studying are those letters what are the contents of those letters? And how do those letters synchronize and agree with doctrine? And if there's any part of the letter that does not agree with doctrine, we put it to a dustbin. Because the revelation was given by angels. Angels gave the revelation to John. So, these letters were written to the seven churches by John as a guide to discernment. Discernment. And not warnings about the end time. The letter of Revelation is not a warning about the end time. No, it is a guide to discernment. It's not also a warning to the end of the age. No, it was a guide to discernment. So pay a very close attention to these words. Revelation chapter 1 from verse 4. Read for me. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Notice the word B is italicized which implies it was inserted by the translators of the King James Version and not in the original text. Thus the statement can be better understood as grace and peace unto you Grace and peace. Once you put B, it's like a prayer. Now, B is not in it. It is grace and peace unto you. It's not a prayer. That's the reality of what you have in Christ. What do you have in Christ? Grace and peace. So I can't be praying for you to have what you already have. I can only say to you what you have in case you're not aware. So you can come to a place of acknowledging. So grace and peace to you. That's why the B is in italics. It was added by translators. And I'm going to prove that a little bit to you right now. Grace and peace to you. So his audience were recipients of the grace of God. They were already recipients. And this is very similar to Brother Paul's opening and closing of all his letters. All the letters of Paul were opened and closed like that. Romans 7, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 16, 24, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. 1 Corinthians 1, 2, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. First Corinthians 16, 23. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Second Corinthians 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all Achaia. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Second Corinthians 13, 14. Read for me. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Galatians 1, 2. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 6, 18. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 6.24. Read for me. 
Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Philippians 1 1, Paul and Timothy, the servant of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ, Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 4 23, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Colossians 1 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 4.18, the salutation by the hand of me, Paul, remember my bones, grace be with you, amen. 1 Thessalonians 1.1, 1, 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father. And in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.28, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, amen. 2 Thessalonians 1.1, 1, 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy unto the church of the Thessalonians in God and our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you, and peace from God our Father and and the Lord Jesus Christ. Second Thessalonians 3.18, read for me. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. First Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God, our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, and Jesus Christ, our Lord. First Timothy 6.21, read for me. Which some professing have heard concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. Second Timothy 1 to read for me. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Second Timothy 4.22, read for me. The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Titus 1.4, read for me. To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Titus 3.15. All that are with me salute thee. Greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. Philemon chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. Verse 2. And to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Philemon verse 25. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Now this is also similar to the opening and closing words of the writer of the book of Hebrews, Peter and John. Hebrews 13, 25. Grace be with you all. Amen. First Peter 1, 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 1, read for me. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. 2 John 1, 3. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father in truth and love. Now if you observe all the B, B, B are in italics. All, everywhere we read, everywhere you see B is in italics. Meaning that the translators were the ones who put the B. Otherwise, it was not trying to tell, pray for them to have grace. It was informing them of what they already have in Christ. Ephesians 2, 5, even when we were dead in sins had quickened us together, by grace you are saved. You are saved by grace, so you already have grace. And has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For where is workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained. That we should walk in them. Hence, Brother Peter will now write in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Read for me, Second Peter 3, 18. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. The believer can grow in grace because he has been saved by grace. The only reason why you can grow in grace is... Is because you're already saved by grace. And that growth primarily 
is a function of knowledge. That growth is a function of knowledge and not effort. Is a function of knowledge. Not effort, not prayer. Is a function of knowledge. Every day you come and you're hearing me teach, you're growing in grace as a result of the knowledge you're receiving. First Peter chapter 2 verse 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the world that you may grow thereby. Now, I said all of that to come back to Revelation chapter 1 verse 4 to 6. Read for me very carefully. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Five. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now let me ask you an intelligent question before I drop a few more revelations and then we close. When he wrote Revelation chapter 1 verse 4 to 6, is he talking about what God will do in the believer or what God has done in the believer? All right. So if it is what God has done in the believer, that means that is the premise on which the book is written. That means anything you see in the book that does not agree with what Christ has done in the believer, throw it away. Because in his introduction, doctrinally, before he shares with you the vision. Are you following? Before he tells you what he saw in the vision. Before he gives you the metaphors. Before he gives you the symbols. Before he tells you about the horses and the beasts and the, and the dragon. He first of all establishes your position doctrinally. Put that verse, verse 4 again. Let me read so that you can hear me clearly. John to the seven churches which are where in Asia. What does he say to them? Grace unto you and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come. That means what I'm about to say to you is from he that has the past, the present, and has seen the future. That means the future can change it. Whatever I will say about the future cannot change this position. Whatever I will say about the past cannot change this position. And whatever I will say about the present cannot change this position. Which position? And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Okay? Even the spirits that gave me revelation, all of them, look at what he's about to say. Next verse. And from Jesus Christ himself, who is the faithful witness, and the prototokos, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. This is what he has done. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins, where? In his own blood, verse 6. And hath, 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 and hath made us. He's not going to make us. So if you read anything in the revelation that the angels brought that makes you look like you're not a king, throw it away because doctrinally, as we introduce the subject, we have established your position. Has made us kings and priests unto our God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, that is the doctrinal position of the believer. That is your position. Now, that word first begotten is the word prototokos, which implies prototype, a model. It is like a model of what others will be like. That is, when you see the first begotten or the firstborn, then you will know what all the other children are made of. It was the same word Brother Paul used and the writer of Hebrews in their epistles. Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Colossians 1, 18. 
and is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. In all things, he might have the preeminence. Hebrews 12, 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. In the incarnation, John, in his synoptic account, referred to Jesus as the only begotten. Only. But in the epistles, he's referred to as the first begotten. John 1, 14, only begotten. John 1, 18, only begotten. John 3, 16, only begotten. But in the resurrection, which is consistent in the epistles, he's the first begotten. In other words, John began to relate the things he saw and heard. Firstly, he laid a foundation. He laid a foundation of the believer's identification with Christ in his resurrection. The new birth. So that Revelation 1, 4 to 6 was to deal with your identification with Christ in his resurrection. That's why in verse 5, he says, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So the identification is in his blood, which means resurrection. The word prince was translated from the Greek word akon, which implies the beginning. Hence, he expressly stated, verse 6, and had made us kings and priests unto God and his father. Now, the statement, unto him that loved, past tense, loved, past tense, was translated from the Greek word agape or agapao. Agape or agapao, which implies to sacrifice. The love of God is sacrifice. The love of God. For God so loved, and what was the action he gave? sacrifice he explained how god did it how he did it was he washed us from all our sins how in his own blood that's the sacrifice in his own blood so if you watch carefully from the things i have done in the last 50 minutes or thereabout we've established that redemption your salvation is jesus's work okay and you know, Pastor Praise, why Paul, I mean John, took time to do that is because of the things he's going to be saying that he saw in the vision. There are things he saw in the vision that if you do not understand this position that you have, it can unsettle you. So to avoid that, so it does not come as another gospel, he took time to first of all, doctrinally establish your position. You are washed. You are cleansed in his own blood. You are righteous. So, meaning that the seven churches that were written to was a letter written to believers. Believers who are not come face to face with the doctrine of Christ. The gospel of Christ. The message of Christ. Believers who had developed itching ears to hear another gospel. It's like somebody came to this church and said, why don't we do uh, uh, relationship panadol? You know relationship panadol? That is when relationships are sick, you give them panadol. And that, that should be taught from the pulpit. That's not the message of Christ. The message of Christ is the hallmark of Christian ministry. The reason why we stand here every Sunday and Wednesday to give you word is because we have Christ to give to you. Charles Paul John said, if a preacher finds out that he doesn't have enough Christ to give, he should leave the pulpit because he has nothing to offer. Amen. Amen. You are washed. You are cleansed in his own blood. Can somebody shout hallelujah? hallelujah. The revelation of Jesus, therefore, is the revelation of what he has done that has begotten you. As a firstborn from the dead. Meaning, when I see him, whatever I see in him, because I'm a product of who he is, is a reflection of who I am. 
I declare over somebody here under the sound of my voice that you grow in the revelation of Jesus. I'm not hearing that, amen. amen. I say you grow in the revelation of Jesus. Stand on your feet and say with me very loud at the top of your voices, I grow in knowledge. I grow in grace. Now turn to somebody and say to your neighbor, the revelation of Jesus in this season of teachings will grow big on your inside until nothing else matters. I thought somebody would shout a powerful amen. amen. Lift your right hands, Father. I pray for everybody watching on television, on Facebook, in this house, in our campuses. That in these moments of learning and growing in the revelation of Jesus, that this revelation will grow big on our inside until nothing else matters. I decree that barriers are broken. Lord, I declare that your word will grow mightily and prevail over circumstances. The remaining days of this week, I declare you win over situations of life. Barriers are broken. Obstacles are broken. By the revelation of who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, I decree that 2,000 years ago, he spoke principalities and powers. He made a public show of the devil and triumph over the devil. I decree that that victory is yours right now. You are living here with that victory today. You are blessed beyond the cause. You are kept by the power of God. Grace is multiplied in your life. In the name of Jesus, every struggle ceases right now. In the name of Jesus, by the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, I decree the remaining days of your life, you reign in life. You reign in life. You reign in life. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And every believer says that amen like a believer. Amen. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Oh my goodness, what a service. I know you've been blessed by the word of his grace. Please don't go away. Don't go away. The essence of the teaching of God's word is to build you up, equip you, so you can do the work of ministry. That's the whole essence. Not just to acquire knowledge and see that, but to teach you so you can teach others. Brother Paul says, the things that you have learned of me among many witnesses, the same you commit to others who shall also commit to others. Two things. Number one, if you don't belong to a Bible teaching church where the message of Christ is taught, where the revelation of Jesus is brought to you, then you either join one of our campuses or you can begin one in your community and become the lighthouse for other believers to assemble around and be fed and be taught the word. And today you want to join either a campus of ours or you want to start a campus. All you need to do is shoot me a mail, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com with your details. We shall get in touch with you and we shall work with you, equip you and train you. And we shall walk you through establishing a campus or being a part of one of our already existing campuses in your locality. Lastly, I've written a number of books to address doctrinal issues and to answer questions that you might have. They are on the screen right now. Today, if you require any of those books, you want to order for them, or all of them, or you want to order for our CDs or DVDs, shoot a mail also to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com requesting for the materials, and our office will get in touch with you and see how they can work out getting the books to wherever you are around the world. I'm excited that I'm able to be a blessing to you today. Remember, I'm live here on Facebook every morning at 10 a.m. GMT plus 1, 12 noon GMT plus 1, 6 p.m. GMT plus 1, and 10 p.m. GMT plus 1. Many times a day, feeding you, feeding you, feeding you, equipping you, because we want you to come to a place of robust understanding of an effective relationship between you and God. Share with other people as you look forward to continuing to be a blessing in your life. And until I see you in the next broadcast, enjoy the rest of your day and be blessed. Amen. Stay.